recent, or in, in the near future, we've got a downsizing seminar that if you're looking to downsize, you can sign up for that. We've also got Graduate Sunday coming up next week, which is a momentous time in so many of our lives. And then finally, because this is a Memorial Day weekend and a holiday, the offices will be closed tomorrow. So if you show up looking for help, you will be waiting for a while until Tuesday. Well, as we gather for worship on this Memorial Day weekend and on, in particular on this Pentecost Sunday, we've got two readings from Scripture that I'd like to share with you. Our first one comes from the book of Acts. This is hopefully a familiar passage to many of you. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. This is what Luke writes. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. When they return, then they returned from Jerusalem to the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered into the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons, and he said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. Hope you ate breakfast already. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their language Hakeldama, that is, field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead become desolate and let there be no one to live in it. Let another take his position of overseer. So one of the men who have, who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take, this place, to take his place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lots fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. So, I completely read the wrong passage. <laughs> Did you guys pick that up? That was a test. Was anybody in Acts? All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
So there is a passage in Acts where the Holy Spirit descends in tongues of fire. That was the one I was supposed to read. I'm not going to go back and do that. That's what you get when you make corrections to your notes, like right before the service started. (laughs) What I want to do this morning is take that passage in Acts chapter 2, and I want to contrast it with John's version of the event of Pentecost in John chapter 20. And so I'm going to uh, hopefully get to the right place and read to you, actually, John chapter 20. Oh my gosh, guys, this is rough. So sorry. Yeah. I think what I did was, so I have my Bible program, and I think when I put Acts in, it put in the whole book of Acts for me to read. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Is it? Yeah. One of these days, I will. It is. It is. It's a good story. And, uh, and then this will be a good story one day, hopefully, that I can, you know, use in another sermon about <laughs> what not to do. seriously did that, guys. I put in the whole book of Acts. Okay, John, we're here. John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. Thank you for the grace this morning. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and he stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful for this time to gather together this morning. We're so grateful for the gift of your Holy Spirit in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would move among us as we hear your word this morning. May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all our hearts together be pleasing in your sight this morning. Amen. So, today is Pentecost Sunday. And and on this day, we celebrate one of the most significant days in salvation history. And this is the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. And as I said, we're most familiar with the story as we see it and read it in the book of Acts, where the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples. They're gathered in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit descends in the form of these flaming tongues of fire. But this morning, I want to look at this particular event through a different lens. I want to look at it through the lens of the Gospel of John. And I want to put this incredibly powerful, joyous event in the context of the larger narrative of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so as we enter into that narrative world this morning, I want to to begin by sharing with you a story about this little boy and how this story brings us into this narrative world in an important way. So one year, there was this five-year-old little boy, and he had been working on an art project in his kindergarten class. He had planned to give this art project to his dad as a gift for Christmas. And he had labored over this gift meticulously for months. It was this clay sculpture that really resembled nothing, but it was his Pieta. It was what he was going to give to his dad. And so as he finalized his masterpiece with some paint and some time in the kiln, he wrapped it up and he was ready to give it to his dad. 
He was beside himself with, dis- with excitement. As December came, he couldn't hardly contain himself. He was so excited to give this gift to his dad. So he, he wrapped it up. When Christmas break finally came, both of his parents came to pick him up that particular day. And he grabbed his gift. And with great excitement, he started running across the cafeteria floor. And guess what happened? Yep, he tripped It goes flying into the air, and it lands shattering on the floor with this deafening sound that silences the entire room. And he sat there laying next to this shattered vision of his, crying. And his mom comes up to him and begins to hold him. And I imagine that as I think about what this boy was feeling in this particular moment, that this is really similar to what the disciples were experiencing in John chapter 19, one chapter before this story about the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And specifically, I go back to Jesus' words in uh, in verse 30 when he says, It is finished. As the disciples are are sitting there with these dreams that they had about this long-awaited Messiah, and now they sit there at the foot of the cross with these dreams and this vision shattered, and they hear these words, it is finished, and they must have been crushing to the disciples at this point. Now, in today's text, the disciples encounter the risen Jesus who commissions them to continue the work that he had began. And again, the contrast of these two moments is remarkable. Seeing the risen Jesus versus thinking it was all over. And so we happen upon the disciples in John 19, going back there again, as they had waited for Jesus And they had waited for him to come, and they had waited for the Messiah. And when he died on the cross, they had to have been filled with despair at that particular moment. And then in John chapter 20, when we come back to that passage, what we find here is nothing less than the promise of what Jesus had given to the disciples in John chapter 14. If you remember back in John chapter 14, Jesus appears to his disciples. This is his final discourse. It's right after he has washed the feet of the disciples. And he tells to them that he is going to send the Spirit who will enable them to do the inconceivable to do the works that he had done and to do works that were even greater than what he did. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine sitting there in that moment and thinking of this journey that you had been on with Jesus? All the, you know, in in John's gospel, it starts with turning water into wine. It escalates all the way to the point of a person rising from the dead in Lazarus. And Jesus promises that he's going to send the advocate and that they will do things that he had been doing and they will do things that are even greater. And so that is their hope. And then we get to chapter 19 with the arrest torture and death of Jesus and all that comes to a crashing halt in John 1930 when Jesus says it is finished and as we go through life we all experience losses of various types children graduate especially at this time of year and they they move on and that brings to the end of it brings a season of parenting to end to an end that is sad. We experience the loss of friendships, marriages end in divorce, spouses pass away. Sometimes we even receive life-changing health diagnoses that might even mean that 
our sojourn on this particular earth is coming to an end. And as we come to grips with the reality of that loss, that something precious to us is coming to an end, we might hear these words of Jesus, it is finished, and it might reverberate through our souls like an earthquake. It feels shattering and it feels destructive, but how we hear those words will make a profound difference in what happens next in our lives. And there's, I think, a couple of ways we can hear these particular words. As we mourn the loss of something precious, do we hear these words, it is finished as a declaration of finality that tears away from us hope of a future life, of, of, of vital living and joy and peace? Or do we hear these words, it is finished as an acknowledgement of loss, but also a moment that is pregnant with hope for the future of what might come, of what God might bring into our lives. And by the grace of God, when we hear these words, when we come to, the real, when we come to grips with that reality that something precious in our life has come to an end, we hear it with the sense that the end of one thing is the beginning of another. Now, before I continue, I want to say a word to those who might be dealing with terminal diagnoses whether you're sitting in this room or whether you're watching online. And I can imagine, and especially as someone who's gotten some serious health diagnoses and you wonder what the future holds, that when someone says to you, the end of something is the beginning of another, those words might ring really empty to you this morning because you might say to yourself, if I'm facing death, what future is there for me? And I hope, I hope with all, all of my being, that God would bring a miraculous healing into your life, if that's you. I hope with all my being, but if that doesn't happen, I hope that you can hear the words of hope in the gospel, that the final word is never, ever death. The final word is always resurrection. Yes, it might mean the end of our sojourn on this earth, but our hope is in the good news that Jesus rose from the dead and that there is a future ahead of us even beyond this life. That doesn't make the, the loss of what might have been any less acute for us. And, and, and I hope you don't hear me saying that if you're in this particular situation that you don't have the right to grieve, that you don't have the right to be angry about it. I hope you will take the time to be sad and to be angry. That is absolutely a part of it. But I hope you'll hear the message that the end of one thing is the beginning of another, even if it's in the next life. And when we hear these words, it is finished. Hopefully we hear it not in terms that the book has come to an end, but this particular chapter has come to an end. And that's exactly what we're dealing here with here in the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Chapter 19 comes to an end, but we know that's not the end of the book. We know that there's more to the story than that. And so as we think about whatever loss we're facing, and again, it can be devastating as a terminal diagnosis, but hopefully, when we think about that phrase or that, that, those words of Jesus that it is finished, that the it that is finished is just that chapter in our life. It's not this sense that we can go on and we can have a new experience of joy and vitality in our lives. And John's gospel suggests to us that the way the disciples heard these words of Jesus, it is finished, was in the incorrect way. They thought that it was over. They thought that the book was going to end right there, that there weren't more chapters ahead. And we know this because in John chapter 20, verse 9, we learned that the as, for as yet the disciples did not understand the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. They struggled to understand the promise of the scriptures that death Whatever its form is not the final word. Resurrection is the final word. And we know, because we've read the book already, we know that 
Three days later, Jesus was going to rise again. But in that moment, the disciples didn't have that knowledge. Jesus had tried to communicate that. We know that, but it didn't sink in, and we can all relate to that. We can all relate to the disciples in that particular moment where we're facing a a loss that is difficult, that is tearing us up, and it's hard to see the future, even though we might know and have heard and been told that the gospel promises us that death is never the final word on whatever we're going through. And so as we think about where the disciples are at, it would be extremely arrogant for us to to envision that with judgment. Instead, we need to envision that with compassion because we've, we've all been there and I guarantee you some of us in this room right now are there right now where we're, we're wondering, after this loss, what the heck is next? How can something good possibly come from this? So the disciples, they find themselves in this moment of despair. And this brings us to today's text, which picks up on the evening of Jesus' resurrection. And as we continue to follow this story, we're we're challenged not only with embracing the idea that death is never the final word, but also that we are called to let go of the past. That if we hang on to things, it prevents us from moving forward into the future. And the text illustrates that for us. Earlier that day, Peter and John, they both, they raced to the tomb to discover that it was empty. And again, they still didn't get it, right? They, they show up there and it's just empty and this is a mystery to them. And what we can tell from the text is, is John and Peter, they, they, they go on in their day pondering what this might mean because they still don't get it. But Mary's still there and the gardener appears to her or so she thinks it's the gardener. But it turns out that it's Jesus and when she realizes that it's him, she embraces him. She holds on to him because she's so relieved to see her friend and her Messiah again. And what does Jesus say to her in John 20, verse 17? He says this, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, I don't believe for a moment, I mean, an ungenerous way of interpreting this passage is that that was pretty rude. I mean, (laughs) Jesus has appeared to this follower who has been beside herself at his death, and he says, well, don't hold on to me. But I don't think that's what's going on here at all. He doesn't want her to hold on to him because he knows that if she lets go of him, ultimately he can go to the Father and send the Spirit, and a new experience of God's presence in their life can emerge. And so he says, don't hold on to me. And I think whenever we've lost something precious, our inclination is to hold on to it, to want to grab onto it and not let go. And again, going back to John chapter 16, Jesus says these words, but I have said these things to you, talking about the sinning of the Spirit, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I didn't say these things to you in the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to send, I'm, now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me where are you going because I have said these things to you. Sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And we know where the story goes from there. If Mary holds on to Jesus, we can't turn the page and move on to the next chapter. And so there's this sense in which we lose something precious. Yes, we need to acknowledge the grief of that loss. But we also need to know that that's not the final word. And we also need to know that there is this call to let go of it so that God can bring something new into our lives. 
So when we take this story today about the coming of the Spirit and we put it into the larger context of the gospel story, it's important to not isolate this beautiful, gorgeous moment of Pentecost and not realize that it follows extreme pain for the disciples. It's important for us to realize that oftentimes in those deepest, those darkest moments, it's when it's the most difficult to believe in resurrection, it's those moments that come before some beautiful gift, some new expression of God's presence in our lives. And as I close, I want to go back to the story of the boy. So you'll recall that he has lost his gift. (laughs) It's broken. It's shattered on the floor. He's there. He's crying. His mom rushes up to him, and so does his dad. But the dad was really uncomfortable with the situation because it's a a big scene. Everybody's staring. The boy's crying. And in his attempt to comfort his son, the father says to the little boy, it's okay, son. It doesn't matter. Well, mom, rightly so, glares at dad. (laughs) And she says, oh, yes, it does matter. And then she just sat there and she rocked her son in her arms as he cried. And it was not too long after that that he stopped crying. And she said, well, let's see what we can go make of this. So they take this sculpture that's shattered in pieces. It was beautiful in its colors. It just didn't look like much, as a, as a five-year-old might put together. And so they go home, and they rework it together, and somehow they are able to create this butterfly, this multicolored butterfly sculpture with some ingenuity and some Gorilla Glue. They put it back together, and it ends up being this beautiful new thing in their lives. And the father learned a big lesson. He took that with him, and he kept it on his desk as a reminder. What this story reveals to us is it expresses what I think is also in the gospel is that God can take something that seems utterly broken and irreparable and create something beautiful about that. It can can create something beautiful with it. And I think the story is also helpful in helping us to think about how we respond to others in the midst of their loss. We should respond like the mom did. We don't need to say it doesn't matter because it does matter. And we might look back on a broken piece of of ceramic sculpture and say in the grand scheme of things, that's not a big deal. But in the economy of a five-year-old, that's everything. And so when we look at other people and we look at their losses and we might wonder, why are you so upset about that? Because in their economy, it's something else. It's something different. And so the appropriate response is to sit with them and to come alongside of them in that journey and to help them know that it's not the end of the book. It's just the end of a chapter. And that's what Pentecost reveals to us that when we find ourselves in those darkest moments, that's not the end. The beginning, or the end of one thing, is the beginning of something new for us. So I have seven questions this morning. If you guys know me, you know that I like to end a sermon with questions for reflection. And I'm just going to read these out because this is what I felt these are the ones I felt like God was, was giving to me as I was preparing this sermon. And um, see which ones resonate with you. Question number one, what loss are you experiencing? Question number two, do you know someone in your circle of relationships who is experiencing a loss? Three, who are the people in your life who will share your loss with you in a healing way? Who are those people in your life? Four, if you know someone who's experienced a loss, how can you be present with them in a healing way as they navigate that loss? Five, do you need to ask God to help you hear the words, it is finished, as the end of a chapter and not the end of a book? 
Six, is it time to let go of the past to welcome a new experience of God's presence in the future? And my last question is this. What sort of beauty might God bring into your life as you move into the next chapter through your loss? And we're going to have some time to just pray and be silent together. And I encourage you to just sit with whatever question or questions the Spirit moved within you. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you with open hearts with these questions, and we pray that you speak to us. And if there's some other question, some other thought that we should be sitting with in your presence this morning, bring that to our minds now. God, we are grateful for your grace. We confess, Lord, that sometimes in the midst of our loss and in the midst of our pain, it's hard for us to perceive that grace, but we know that it's there nonetheless. I pray for all of us who are going through some sense of loss right now. Help us to have space and people in our lives to mourn that, but help us to also have hope that ultimately this leads to a new experience of your presence in our lives, a new sense of life and vitality, a new sense of fire within our hearts. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we confess our faith together? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin, and all who seek to live at peace with one another. As we come to the table, let us join together in the prayer of confession. Generous God, you send us the spirit of courage, but we have been afraid. You send us the spirit of truth, but we cling to our illusions. You send us the spirit of healing, but we cannot let go of our hurts. Holy Spirit of forgiveness, Come to us again, shake our hearts, set our souls on fire with your love. Send us out into the world, rejoicing in your power. We hold out to you all our particular burdens of guilt and sin, and we ask for your help to live the way of your justice and love.
The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Please stand and greet one another. We now come to our time of offering. We appreciate your generosity, all the ways that you support the mission of Tri-Lakes United Methodist Church. If you have a gift that you'd like to give today, we've got a box at the back of the sanctuary there against the wall. You can drop your offering in there. You can also go online and give that way. As we prepare to receive these gifts, whether online or here this morning, let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for all of your provision that you give to us in our lives. We confess that all things come from you and that we are only stewards. And so as we receive from you and we now give back a portion of what you've given to us, we pray that you take these gifts and use them for your kingdom. Use them to bring new life to those who need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let us continue in prayer as we receive communion. Father, we gather together this morning to celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of your son, Jesus. We think about your goodness in our lives, how you didn't need to, but you spoke and created all things, and you created us in your image, and you've loved us unconditionally. Even when our love failed, your love never has. And when we were lost and dead in our transgressions, Lord, you sent your son Jesus. You became incarnate. You you joined our condition in order that we might know what it's like to be restored in relationship with you and to be reconciled with one another. As we prepare to come to this table and celebrate that reconciliation with you and with one another, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. We pray that you make for them, you would make them into the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ one in ministry to all in the world. Lord, as we prepare our hearts to come to this table, would you welcome us? May these elements be medicine to our souls. And as we come to the table, we pray the prayer which you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In just a few moments, we'll invite you to come forward for communion. You are welcome to kneel at the rail if you would like. You can also stand and hold out your hands. We will place a wafer in your hand, and then someone will come by with a cup of juice for you. If you prefer a gluten-free option or you need that for health reasons, just let us know, and we can provide that for you. Let us come to the table.
Let us pray. Thank you for feeding us in this sacrament, Lord. We pray that we would take this grace that has come to us this morning and give it to those that we encounter throughout the rest of this day and throughout the rest of our lives. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us and we'll worship together one more time before we leave today. Here we go. Falling from the clouds, a strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. wonderful Sunday and Monday, and we'll see you next week.
Practice your thing, John.